Hey guys, welcome to episode three of Ask Jungle Scout. Today we've got Greg here as well, and together we're gonna answer your latest questions. Lenny, thanks for having me, I'm excited. You know, normally you're in Australia, I'm usually elsewhere, but for the next few weeks we get to do uh, Ask Jungle Scout together, which is fantastic. So jumping right in, Mr. JCC357 asked, I wanted to ask if I should get a sample from China before negotiating a price or vice versa. Lenny, what do you think? Generally speaking, I would um, negotiate a price before getting a sample. Um, because samples do cost a fair bit, like anywhere between $50 to $100 or sometimes maybe a little bit more, you don't want to get a, a sample and you know not be happy with the price. Uh, then it sort of makes it a bit redundant. It's kind of pointless having that sample if you're if there's no possibility of you actually using that supplier. But that's my take. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, and I agree with you. I'm going to add one thing to that, and that is the one advantage of getting a sample first is you are letting the factory and the supplier know that you're serious and that you're a serious buyer. You're like, I'm willing to spend the fifty or hundred dollars to get the sample. Um, so it's much more likely I'm going to go through this deal with you. So a lot of times I'll find that they're more willing to kind of like work with you, uh, especially on the price after they know you're a little bit serious. But I agree with you. I usually try to sort out pricing before I get my sample. And to be completely honest with you, you have the most negotiating power on your second and third and fourth order and so on. Because that's when they know, okay, this is a serious buyer. Uh, maybe you're placing a bigger order at that point. Um, and yeah, it just lets them know that, you know, this is going to be a long-term relationship. So it's beneficial to work out like a, a good price for both of us. All right. Question two is from Noreen Imtiaz. Do you prefer UPC or EAN codes for the UK? What do you think, Greg? Good question. Uh, it's usually safer just to go with the EAN codes and those are European type barcodes. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, the difference here is UPC. I think that's generally used in America or North America. Uh, the EAN codes are used for Europe. I think Amazon would accept both of them, but just to be safe, I'll just go with the EAN code. I'll just add in here that I normally like to print the FN SKU, which is the unique identifier for Amazon products straight on my packaging. So I normally don't even put the UPC or EAN on the packaging. I prefer just to put Amazon's FN SKU and that way you don't have to label any of it. It's already printed on your packaging. From my experience, I think the FN SKU, like I said, is the most important thing to have on there and is the one thing that is quite necessary from Amazon's point of view. Um, and if you do get it printed on your packaging, just make sure that it is scannable before they sort of print all of them. Because um, if it isn't scannable, then it won't be accepted by Amazon. And a quick little trick that I've found to check whether it is scannable, you can ask the factory to send you a picture of the packaging and just on your screen, you can use the Amazon app on your phone. It has a scanner and you can scan it right on your screen. And if uh, more often than not, it should be able to scan even on your screen. Yeah, I did not know that. It's yeah. very cool. <laughs> George Laser asks, what would be the maximum number of sellers you would compete with? Considering that you want to sell the same product, but with different customizations. And George, what I think you're trying to ask here is not necessarily how many sellers are on a particular listing, but how many listings are selling the same type of product. Because it doesn't really matter that much how many sellers are on one particular listing, because if it's only one listing, it's only taking up that much real estate in the search results. Um, and that's what we really care about. Most Amazon consumers actually don't know that there's like multiple sellers competing for the same listing. So with that assumption in mind, um, I don't like to see like, three or four or five pages of results of all of the same type of product, the same type of listing, that would be pretty competitive. But for me, what's more important than how many listings there are, are the quality of the listings, okay? So a really high quality listing with really good images, you know, great bullet points, uh, a full description, all that kind of stuff, um, that concerns me more than just the sheer number of listings. Again, the number of reviews for the listings and the average star rating of the listings, that's what I'm going to be more concerned with uh, in this particular case. So if there are like five pages of all the same listings, that would be kind of troublesome to me. If there's just like one page of results um, of similar products, um, then I wouldn't be worried about that. But again, I'm more so looking for the quality of the listings mm -hmm. and the quality of the competition, not necessarily just how many uh, listings there are. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's all about the quality of the listings. I've seen situations where there's been five or 10 pages of listings for a particular product, but it's still been okay because after maybe page two, every single listing has like no reviews or three reviews and you can see the product been up for like two years or 
or a long time. And so you can tell, even though there is quite a number of pages, um, that most of them you know, aren't really, you can tell they're not doing any sales or they're not relevant. So I would add on that you know, sometimes you can have more than a couple of pages, but it's still be okay. Would you agree? Absolutely, I yeah. agree. All right, question four is from jtito77. So I can see with your question that you've been dealing with a supplier and they've been away for 10 days holiday and you're wondering, you know, what can you do in this situation? Are you being burned? Are they just sort of fobbing you off? What do you think, Greg? So during this time of year, so every year, either at the end of January, or the beginning of February is the Chinese New Year. And Chinese New Year is a big deal in China. Yeah. Uh, the factory workers usually take off a whole month, sometimes six weeks. Uh, the sales reps, they usually take off less time. They'll usually only be off for like two weeks. But during this time, you can expect radio silence. Uh, I see this every year, people freaking out about this. Um, normally, like I said, there is radio silence that won't be replying to your emails. And the factory workers legit take off like a full month. They um, oftentimes in China, uh, people will work like inland, you know, they'll go to the factories, they work there 11 months out of the year, and then they have one month off to go back to see their family. So I seriously doubt you got burned, all right? This is just the, that time of year that they're away from the factories, away from their offices. Um, I imagine once the factory comes back, I'm sure they'll you know, start back up on your order. But this time of year, it is the, the slow season um, until everyone gets back and then gets work out again. So I wouldn't worry too much. I think you'll be fine. All right, question five is from Max. Since I will private label different products in different categories, can I establish more than one brand to sell on but use the same Amazon Seller Central account? What do you think, Greg? Max, you absolutely can. So a lot of people get this confused, but your seller storefront name is totally different than any brand names. One seller storefront name, let's pretend it's called Greg's Products, okay? This is a totally different entity, you know, totally different area than any brand names that I create. They don't have to be the same. A lot of people assume they have to be the same and that's not true. So I can have Greg's products as my seller storefront name. It doesn't really matter what you name your seller storefront name. Okay. And then I can have lots of different brands that I could sell. You'll, you can go on Amazon. You'll see some people might sell thousands and thousands of different products that all are different brand names. Um, and that's perfectly fine and that's you know totally cool. So feel free to do that. Don't think that you have to have the seller store name the same as the brand name. And the place where you set that is when you create a listing, it asks for the manufacturer and that's where you can put in whatever you want the manufacturer be, to be for that particular product. And Max's second question was, how do you go about doing patent research on a product you're interested in without the use of an attorney? And this is a really good question. And to start off, I will say, of course, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know what I've done in the past and what other Amazon sellers have done. And here's a few things you can do. For one, the US's official uh, website for searching for patents and trademarks is USPTO.gov. You can start by trying to do a search for the type of product on that website. However, I will admit that it's not super user friendly. It's not real easy to do. So I'll let you know about a few other places that you can do a patent search that in my opinion are a little bit more friendly. Now, I'll also say at the end of the day, the only way to know for sure 100% without a doubt is to hire a lawyer. However, it is kind of expensive. So I've kind of found ways to be able to get around that. For one, you can look at the competitor's product on Amazon and see if it's listed in there that it's a patented product. Uh, a lot of people, you know, are proud of that. They want to kind of show that off in their marketing. So let's say, you know, the patented spring assist system, whatever else. That's obviously a, a telltale sign that there is a patent for that particular product. Another way is you can just do a Google search. If I'm selling my stainless steel water bottle, I can search for stainless steel water bottle patent. And a lot of times if there is a patent for that product, it will show up through that Google search. The third way that I like to search to see if there's a patent or the other one that like raises some red flags is how many other people are selling a very similar or identical product. If there's only one person selling the product and it's a pretty unique kind of proprietary looking type product, then there's a pretty good chance there's a patent on it. If there's a hundred different sellers all selling the exact same garlic press or whatever else, chances are it's not patented because if so, the patent holder would have gone after all those people selling the product. So those are a few ways that you can usually be pretty sure that the products, whether the product's patented or not, without having to hire an attorney. I'd agree. And I mean, it is possible that sometimes a listing may not 
uh, it may not say if it's been patented, but usually if you think about it, uh, having a patent is you know, quite a good selling point for that product. It shows that that company is quite serious about what they're doing and usually they've got a unique product or technology. So in most cases I'd say that if it's got a patent, it would say on the listing. So that wraps up the questions for this week. Just remember if you'd like a chance for one of your questions to be answered, make sure you drop it in the comments below. And if you've liked this video, got some value out of it, make sure to give us a thumbs up. Thanks for watching guys. Take care. See ya.